Hi, Evan. Talk to me about what you've announced today. Uh, well, we've announced Raspberry Pi Five. Oh. Uh, it's, it's, yeah, I know, right? I mean, it's it's um it's just an it's it's an incredible. I mean, it's, it's, look, it's a great day for us. It's a product that we've been working on pretty much forever. Uh, you know, we've been working on it since 2016. So wow. if you think about it, when we launched Three Plus, we were working on it. When we launched Four, we were working on it all the way through the pandemic, all the way through the supply chain issues, we were working on Pi 5. So this is yeah. a huge project for the team here. Um, we spent something like $25 million on it. It's wow. not cheap at all. Yeah. Uh, it has Raspberry Pi Silicon on for the first time, not, yes. in, the, not in the core socket, but in the IO controller socket. Yep. Um, uh, that's a, uh, that, that's a, a, a chip we call RP1, and that yep. accounts for probably 60% of that spend is on, is on developing RP1. Yep. Uh, it's another 40 nanometer TSMC chip uh, interesting, if you think about it, it says RP1 on it. Yes. RP2040 says RP2 on it. <laughs> uh, RP2 doesn't stand for RP2040. Yep. RP2 is the second chip we started. RP1 is the first chip we started. So actually, this spans the whole of the whole of yeah. sil silicon engineering here at Raspberry Pi, even though RP2 beat it out of the door. Yeah. Um, so it's, look, it's a big day for us. It's, it's vastly more powerful than Pi the Pi Four, yeah. Um, it's something like uh, it's sort of between we say two between two and three X, um, probably for CPU performance on the three X end of that. Yeah. Uh, makes it about getting on for 150 times as powerful as a Raspberry Pi One. Yeah. Um, so it's a it's a lovely it's a lovely device. Um, yeah, the so software stacks is, is is in really good shape. We've got good, good software for launch, um, and we're just super excited to see what people think of it. Yeah. Cool. And what was the design brief for the for the five then? Was there, was there uh, more, limits that you were looking more. to? <laughs> more. <laughs> more. Um, I, the interesting thing about Raspberry Pi, of course, is that well, they, there's very seldom in the in the core product. There's very seldom any kind of quantitative, uh, sorry, qualitative change. Um, uh, we have quantitative change. We add more performance. Yeah. But really, the last time we did something different on the board was Pi three. Yeah. Where we added wi wireless, wi Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. Yeah. Uh, so we don't tend to add new features. We're quite happy with the feature set. We're quite happy with the form factor. But obviously, each generation, there's sort of an expectation that you're going to push uh, by at least a factor of two. You're going to push performance by at least a factor of two. Yeah. Um, yeah. This one's a little more. I think the Pi Four generation was a little more as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, and, that, and really, you know, it, it's it's that simple. Um, yeah. But I think we are at a point where interesting thing. You know, um, the, the overall platform architecture where you have. Uh, a, a fast, digi what, we, what we call a fast, di fast digits chip. Yeah. Uh, you know the, the BCM twenty seven twelve chip from Broadcom. That's a fast digits chip. It has very little analog on. And yeah. Then we put all of the analog, all of the interfacing circuitry on another chip on an older process node. Um, yeah. That's a very possible. That's very very. Uh, it's a very popular thing to do now. It, yeah. I mean, people generally refer to this as a chiplet architecture, uh, where you kind of take your what would have been a, a monolithic chip in previous yeah. generations, and you fragment it into different chips. Yeah. You potentially put them on different process nodes. You can them together with some inter interconnect. That's a very popular thing to do now, but it was actually quite a radical idea back in 2016 when James came up with it. Yeah. Um, uh, and it was interesting that we were able to kind of see far enough ahead to say, well, look, once you get down to 16 nanometers, so the core chip is 16 nanometers, yeah. it's going to become increasingly challenging to make all of those analog interfaces on those advanced process nodes. It's going to get increasingly challenging or at least financially wasteful to make you know, uh, ESD tolerant GPIOs, GPIOs that you're happy for, for kids to go and put their fingers on yep. uh, in those advanced process nodes. Um, and therefore we should, we should split the chip apart. Yeah. This time you've done something that you've not done before, which is to pre-announce it. So yes. talk, me, talk to me about why, why the decision to do that, because that is interesting. <laughs> um, yeah, we, we, we've always been uh, proponents of the, um, of the stock launch, of the, 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 the fully stock launch, and so doing your announcement and availability at the same point. It's actually logistically super inconvenient to do that for <laughs> yeah. a variety of reasons. I mean, simple things like FCC yeah. certification, so you can't import a unit into the US without, uh, without an FCC ID. Yeah. If you get an FCC ID, then they publish it on the their website and it gets tweeted by the FCC bot, right? Yeah. And what this tends to lead to is Americans having slightly delayed availability, which is of course frustrating. Yeah. Um, actually having our software team um, do be able to work in public for the last few weeks of the program is super useful because you've got a lot of repositories, source code repositories, uh, binary repositories, where it's useful to be able to put that stuff out there yeah. rather than having some huge switch that you throw on launch day and hope you throw it right. Yeah. Uh, so th yeah, there, there are some advantages to it. Um, I think it's kind of enabled a little bit historically when we were purely a... Um, uh, a consumer business, there was always that concern that announcing a new product effectively kills demand for your old product. Yeah. Now we're primarily an industrial 
business by by volume. I mean, in terms of where our heart is, yeah. of course, still uh, still enthusiasm, but. Um, in terms of where the volume is, uh, it, it, it's extremely industrial. Yeah. Uh, and that means that we can be confident that we don't need to run our Raspberry Pi 4 volumes down to zero, again, um, <laughs> um, uh, before, we, uh, uh, before we launch, launch Pi 5. Yeah. So you don't have that kind of, like, that kind of cut over anxiety. Yeah. Did the, the pandemic impact the, either the development or the, uh, the cadence, at least, of the releasing of, of these chips? Would you have released it earlier had the pandemic not happened, do you think? Maybe a little bit, although what's not notable about this device, it has three pieces of custom silicon on. So it has RP1, our contribution, the I.O. controller. Yeah. It has um, 2712, which we co-developed with Broadcom. Yeah. Um, and it has uh, a power management chip from yeah. uh, Renesas, formerly Dialog. I've been working on this long enough that they, it was before the acquisition. Uh, that, that chip's called Gilmore. For, for Pi, that they did for, for, for Pi 4 is called Mason. Mm -hmm. um, which means, given that no one's going to make waters, really all that's left is right. Uh, maybe Barrett, if you want to, like a, like a, a very exciting PMEC. Um, so um, the um, so you've got these three uh, you've got these three uh, the, these three custom chips, um, and really they all came ready at about the same time. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, RP1's only really been available to us in volume for the last three months or so. Uh, similarly, uh, maybe the 2712 was available a little bit earlier than that. Uh, mm -hmm. But actually, you would have had to have crunched a lot of programs. I yeah. think what we're learning really is that our natural release cadence at Raspberry Pi, we tell ourselves it's, we remember the days of Pi 2, 2015, Pi 3, 2016, Pi 3 plus 2018, Pi 4, 2019. And we sort of tell ourselves a story about how we have a one to, one to two year cadence. Yeah. I think in practice, what you've got to remember is with the, except, with, with the exception of the addition of Wi-Fi, actually Pi 2, Pi 3, and Pi 3 Plus are kind of a family. Yeah. Um, you know, they are, so if you think Pi 1 is the launch product from like 27, call it 2011, that we first had units. Yeah. Um, uh, Pi 2 is the, the sort of answer to the question, can we build a follow-on chip which is architecturally very similar but just upgrades the ARM core and do that in a way which is financially workable within the constraints of Broadcom. Yeah. Um, uh, Pi 3 and Pi 3 Plus are actually just refinements of that same process. We use the same approach to make, a, uh, to make more 40 nanometer derivatives of 2835. So I'm not sure they actually really count. Even 2 to 3, certainly from a core silicon perspective, doesn't really count as a new product. Yeah. Uh, then Pi 4 comes along in 2019 and Pi 5 comes along in 2023. So what I think we're learning is that for significant platform revisions, our cadence is four years. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and it's hard to imagine. You could imagine maybe if having got something out in the first quarter of this year rather than the last quarter of this year, yeah. maybe if, if the stars were aligned. But a lot of stars would have, have, to, would have had to align. Yeah. And you're kind of appealing to some sort of, some sort of idea that the pandemic and remote working in particular, uh, slowed us down, um, which, are, which I don't think it did. Yeah. Um, uh, so yeah, I, I, think we, I think we've done actually pretty much as well. I don't think, I think it's late compared to where we'd imagined, but I think we were being over-optimistic in, in what we were imagining. And publicly, I mean, you, you, you previously said that it wouldn't be released until 2024 anyway, so yes. it's actually a quarter early. Anyway. Yeah, I, yeah and I, I mean, I think that's something where things have, that is incredibly annoying. As the news of the, you're wondering where your, your Raspberry Pi is. It's that's arrived what, today. What, oh, it's arrived. Is <laughs> yes, okay, well, yes. okay. The next sort of people uh, aren't getting Raspberry Pis because there are 190 of them floating around Cambridge somewhere. <laughs> okay. But it's, it, it's, a, no, it's a measure of, of where we are in the production process today. Yeah. That 190 units is still precious to us, which yeah. it really needs to not be in a week or two. So. <laughs> um, yeah, I think we were, I think, you know, we always wanted to make sure we manage people's expectations um, and other people don't. We don't offer a hostage to fortune. Um, Product introductions, new product ramps are always hard, and any number of things can go wrong. That yeah. it's very easy to lose a quarter, yeah. um, and so yeah, we we really didn't want, particularly given the, the the challenges over the last couple of years, we didn't want to get people excited and then and then let yeah. them down. Yeah. Um, so so yeah, we really wanted to make sure that we were very certain that this was going to work before yeah. we pushed it out. And I mean, there's going to be a lot of people very excited about the Pi Five because uh, you know we've been. As well as having this sort of shortage, there's a lot you can do with a Pi 4 anyway. Mm -hmm. So having a Pi 5 comes out that's got this order of magnitude uh, speed bump, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people are very excited about yeah. this. So one of the questions I've been asked by some of my maker friends is, 
and you might not be able to answer this today because I know you don't like to sort of uh, pre-announce anything else, but like, you know, is there a, is there a compute module five? Is there a, a, a 400, a 500? A 500. Um, is there anything so, like that? Uh, yeah, so we, we don't like to pre-announce products. I mean, obviously there'll be a, there'll be a, a modular derivative of that. Yeah. Um, the 100 series is an interesting question. Um, I think we've, we've got to have a think about what that would look like yeah. in this generation. I think uh, I, I think quite a lot of people know I'm an Amiga guy, yeah. um, and therefore you know I, I think the four Raspberry Pi 400 was a prepositioned gag, <laughs> has associated with it a prepositioned gag, uh, which is Raspberry Pi 500, and it would be a shame not to not to make use of that prepositioned gag, wouldn't it? Be worth it just for the gag. <laughs> it would be worth it just for the gag. Just ship one of them just for the gag. Uh, awesome, and, and a zero three, I guess. Um, I mean, zero three, of course, is 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 a different matter, right? Mm. Because that 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 always has ended up with a different line. I mean, obviously, zero two has the RP three. Oh, no, RP three. Yeah. So that's, when we'd done RP2 and we did RP3 on zero, on zero two W, we really did expect someone to come and ask us what RP1 was. And nobody, <laughs> said, nobody ever did it. So we, um, we're kind of glad we managed to get that one away cleanly. Um, uh, obviously, zero has its own form factor constraints. You look at a Pi 5 and it's not obvious how you would bash that chipset, yeah. um, uh, particularly because it has discrete RAM. I mean, it's always yeah. in discrete RAM because uh, we're very committed to zero being a single sided board. Yeah. And there was really very little real estate there. Yeah. Um, and so it's kind of, a, you, you've got to have RP, you've got to, um, you got to have RP1. You've got to have the the Broadcom chip, which itself is probably too big. Yeah. It's a 17 by 17 mil yeah. uh, BGA, so it's kind of probably itself almost too big to fit on a yeah. uh, to, to to fit into the zero form factor. Yeah. Um, obviously, we'll need to do something there in the future, but but right now, just getting zero two, the fact that we are finally able to get zero two, uh, was a product that yeah. did, that was really was in shortage straight from launch. Yeah. Um, so simply being able to ship zero two reliably is uh, is, is a hell of an achievement. So let's talk about some of the, the features. So you mentioned the RAM there. So I noticed on the uh, the PCB, it's got a little resistor for like eight gig, four gig, which yes. was announced at launch. And mm -hmm. there's also a two and a one. Mm -hmm. No 16 or anything no further? No 16. Mm. Um, no 16 at the moment. Yeah. Chipset doesn't support 16. Yeah. Yeah. But, but I think eight is, I think where, I think you've got to consider the sort of, the, the matching between the performance of the platform and the amount of memory. Yeah. And I think that Pi 4 and 4 gig are very well matched, actually. The processor yeah. and, and 4 gig are well matched, and 8 is a luxury. Yeah. I think in this platform, you've added a factor of, two, factor of 2, factor of 3 CPU performance. The sorts of workloads that lets you run are the sorts of workloads that could use, use, use more memory. Yeah. Um, so I think that probably this is just what we're looking at here is a generation where 8 gig maybe becomes the... It's already the most popular consumer product uh, yeah. in the Pi 4 generation, but where it's really justifiable to go out and spend a little bit of extra money on that, uh, on that yeah. product. Yeah, because uh, certainly with the like machine learning models that you can have on device, that mm. that kind of RAM is a. Yeah. Uh, in the well, the LLM way. models are have very large um, yeah. coefficient sets, yeah. um, and, and so yeah, some, uh, yeah, a platform that can store the entire Llama, you know, the entire yeah. coefficient set for for a lot for Llama, um, yeah. is a useful is a useful thing. Yeah, and you know that that machine learning and computer vision. I mean, I've got Bubo across the desk there that I built. It has the uh, uh, computer vision stuff for detecting hand gestures. Yeah. Um, that kind of stuff will be even better with two cameras. So that's another yeah, two, two cameras, lots more CPU. Of course, it's Cortex A seventy six as well, which means that you get the eight bit instruction. Yeah. So you have this um, you know, the um, there's I don't know. I think it's I think it's on V eight dot two introduces some packed eight bit instruction. So actually, if you want to do, I mean, lots of modern machine vision applications are int 8, yeah. are heavily quantized int 8 models. Yeah. Um, and for those models, you can get a further factor of 2, factor of 4 um, throughput increase yeah. versus uh, an FP32 model. Uh, and plus, I understand that the um, it's now like a four dual four lane uh, yes. bus for the cameras as, or yes. displays. Which and is we need to find some <laughs> find some cameras that can <laughs> yeah. do this, right? Um, there's an interesting, you know, it'll be interesting to uh, be interesting to see what can be what can be done there. I mean, obviously the the cameras that we ship have um, uh, they have two lane interfaces at the moment. There is an interesting question in that the the, um, the nominal rated speed of the of the interface is one and a half gigabits a second, not a gigabit per second. Yeah. So even with the two lane interfaces, you now have a, th a potential three gigabit payload. Yeah. Um, it'd be interesting to see whether there are any whether I haven't gone I haven't gone through and looked. It will be interesting to see whether the, any of the camera devices that we ship support yeah. those modes, and whether we can actually take advantage of, advantage of that in reality. Because it could mean the difference here, particularly when people want to do high frame rate 
rate modes, particularly heavily binned high frame rate modes, yeah. it might open a little bit more in the way of possibility there. And then the, the, the biggest change, I guess, is the, the PCI bus, which is now on the four. It's on the four. No, the biggest, the biggest change is clearly the power button. <laughs> We'll get into that. <laughs> it's, yes. Yes. One change, almost yes. as significant as the power button, is, <laughs> um, is, 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 is the four gigabits of payload over the PCIe um, yeah. connector. That's it's, exciting, right? It really is exciting. So, uh, you know, I know that a lot of people are excited about the you know, M2. You can have a lot more storage, fast mm -hmm. storage on these. So I, yeah. I can imagine that you're going to have an explosion of like home NAS devices. Yes. So not just as a backup, but as like a primary. Yes, I would have. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so yeah. very excited, yeah. and, and that's just one use case. There's mm -hmm. all other kinds of. Uh, I know Jeff Gehling is very excited yes. about uh, the possibilities of, of uh, this. Yeah. So, so yeah, storage is an interesting. Uh, yeah, storage is an interesting one where you've both got. You've got a lot more. You mentioned NASs. You know, if you have if you have RAID devices, um, you have. Uh, if you look on the USB three side, you've gone from having a single, um, effectively a single uh, USB three controller with a hub. In front of it, connected over X1 Gen 2, which is four gigabits. So you don't even have access to the five gigabit payload mm. of one, uh, the nominal five gigabit payload of one USB 3 yeah. um, uh, port to a world where we have four Gen 2 lanes. So we have 16 gigabits of, of link from the core yeah. to the uh, out to the. Um, uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, so PCI Express. Uh, PCI Express, um, the, the second most important feature on the platform after the power button. Um, obviously, you know, this is, uh, you know, you think about storage options for the device. So you've got now got better storage options over USB 3 yes. because you've grown your, your link from the main processor to the controller, which is yep. an RP1, is now a 16 gigabit four lane um, uh, Gen 2, which yep. means the two five gigabit um, uh, USB 3 um, uh, um, uh, ports get sufficient bandwidth. They're not sharing bandwidth. It's not. Yeah. The architecture isn't a single controller and a hub. It's two independent controllers, each of which has a, yeah. a three and a two on it. Yeah. Um, so you've got you've got full you've got full rate. That's particularly handy if you're doing raided. If you want to take a couple of USB yeah. three drives and raid them together. Um, then on the other end of the board, you've got the PCIe um, Gen two, let's say Gen two connector. Yeah. Um, I think it's it's a Gen three controller, but I think we are I think we are going to for conservatism's sake, I think we're going to market it as Gen 2 until we get really comfortable that, uh, yeah. that, that um, particularly that you can build managed impedance FBCs that really let you bring, because it's a custom connector format, right? Yeah. Uh, we want to really convince ourselves that we can manage those signals out onto another board. Yeah. Um, so you've got that, obviously it gives you four gigabits. It is less actually than the USB, uh, less performant than the, the USB uh, is nominally, but you can put an NVMe drive in there. Yeah. Obviously, the goal for us is to be able to put the NVMe, um, uh, is to be able to build a, a hat which will sit inside the official case. Yes. So because once you can encapsulate, if you can encapsulate together the Pi Five, yeah. um, uh, the NVMe drive, the fan, the case, uh, you know, you have something. Particularly as Intel have conveniently uh, um, uh, departed NUC space. Yes. Um, yeah. You have an object which is very much that kind of all-in-one PC with solid-state yeah. storage in inside. Yeah, and I definitely will see um, an explosion of, of um, home storage. So rather than it just being a backup or a secondary, I can imagine this will be the primary you know, place you can store files in your house, yeah. media or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. It's worth um, mentioning, of course, the SD card itself is twice the speed. Ah. So we have SD, SDR 104 yeah. mode support, um, so 104 megabytes yeah. um, support there. That's quite, that's quite, significant. Yeah, that's that's quite significant, actually. It's not yeah. nothing. Yeah. And then you've got the, the power of Ethernet Plus as well, which has got mm. the, uh, the extra power. It's almost double the power, is it, that it can take? Yeah, so we, have, so we have a PRE Plus hat already for the existing uh, yeah. products. What's interesting for us is how our, you know, the, uh, we're, we're building increasingly sophisticated PRE solutions. Um, the, uh, the, PRE, the PRE Plus, uh, in particular, the PRE Plus hat that's, that will ship a little after launch yeah. uh, for this product. It has a, we've gone from having a wound transformer on the PRE. Yeah product to a planar transformer that we buy from the third party. So a planar transformer is where you implement the windings as PCB tracks on a multi-layer PCB yeah. uh, that we buy from a third party to actually doing the transformer layout on our own PCB yeah. um, uh, and then clamping a ferrite around our PCB. So you see the component counts going down, you see the efficiencies going up. With, with all these um, extra um, uh, power that's required for the processor. So I understand there's going to be like a, an extra, a new charger available at launch, a, yes. a five amp charger. Mm -hmm. uh, I was curious to know that you changed the orientation of the USB and uh, Ethernet 
Ethernet Ethernet connector back to the three format. Yeah, so we, we continue to troll the world by, um, if you think there are, there are um, four possible combinations, unless you want to put the Ethernet in the middle, which I would yep. encourage James <laughs> to do at some point. Um, uh, you have four possible combinations of where the Ethernet connector is yep. and where the PoE uh, connector is. Yep. Uh, and we've now explored four of those, uh, three of those four <laughs> op uh, uh, options. Um, so I do wonder whether next generation we might move the Ethernet back to the top <laughs> and leave the PoE uh, uh, four pin connector down the bottom. Uh, but of course, it's all driven by board layout. Right? Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and the it's probably driven in the other direction in the sense that. This is a product we've been working on long enough that we were able, because we have been involved in designing all of the silicon that's on the board, yeah. we were able to design the pinout of RP1 um, in particular yeah. to match the classic layout, the, yeah. the, the OnePlus layout, the, the one yeah. that was used for everything apart from Pi 4. Um, so that's fine, but then what happened was Pi 4 came along in the middle and isn't so co so heavily co-designed. It's an earlier sort of, it comes from an earlier era yeah. uh, where we had to make do with the merchant silicon we could buy, the VLI, the VL805 chip, yeah. um, the, the, uh, and the um, uh, RGMI bus on the 2711 uh, come together to force the Ethernet up into the top right-hand corner. Um, and so you have a generation where we had to put up with um, uh, a, a form factor change. And now, yeah. really, what you're seeing now, probably, all else being equal, we might have left it that way, yeah. except that you're talking about RP1, which had already at that point been designed to support moving it back down again. Yeah. Um, so we are, we are in the bottom right-hand corner. I think, I think both Ethernet and um, PoE in the bottom right-hand corner is the right answer, and we're going to stay there. <laughs> He says. <laughs> and one of the other nice little features, nice uh, sort of premium finishing touches, is the little JST connectors for like the UR, the battery connector, it's really nice. and the fan. Mm. I love also, I, I love that James has managed to uh, find a, a two pin, a three pin, and a four pin. <laughs> yeah. So there's no, there's no risk of plugging the wrong thing into the wrong yeah. thing. You've got two pin for the battery, three pin for the debug, four pin for the, uh, for the mm. fan with tacker. The most important feature, as you've already talked about, is the power button. Power. So I know that's probably one of the biggest requested features, isn't it, on the buy? <laughs> People think it's easy as well. <laughs> um, I mean, this is a payoff from having um, had a lot of input into the PMIC, into the power management, um, yeah. uh, the Gilmore the Gilmore product. Um, and yeah, it, it's a PC-like power button, so it has the behavior. You plug the Pi in, and it turns on by default. That's an yeah. interesting decision. Yep. Um, uh, but you know, it's the right one because yeah. people do. Ex that's what people expect from a Raspberry Pi. And then it's got the single, the kind of single button to to do a soft shutdown. Yeah. Um, a long button press to do a to do a um, uh, to do a hard shutdown. Yeah. Um, and then um, a single button, a short button press to exit from either hard or soft. Yeah. Uh, uh, shutdown. Uh, and that works well. Yeah. Yeah. It gives people what they expect. Yeah. Uh, one of the interesting things is the definition of short, because of course you do want to debounce that that, <laughs> yes. that button press. The, that, that leads to a, a, a surprise death, and also there was sort of some vague desire that if someone picks up and just happens to knock the button, it, it won't uh, it won't yeah. shut down. It, it's interesting the original definition of what had to what how long you had to press it for it to constitute a press was I think 200 milliseconds. It's amazing how long 200 milliseconds is and how frustrating it is <laughs> if you have to press a button for 200 milliseconds. Yeah. Um, so so that number has now been yeah. now been reduced. But it work, it lies to say it works well. Uh, we've been able to in the case have this nice mechanical setup where we have a light pipe, a kind of a lever arm that presses the button that's also a light pipe that connects the LED. Yeah. So yeah. you're then able to broadcast the LED color through the... It's, uh, nice. yeah. Yeah, it's really nice. And one of the nice things that I understand that you're doing is you're releasing this to the maker community um, up to Christmas, up to New Year yes. first. So yes, no industrial right. customers up to up to that point. That's right. So, that's yeah. right. So, so it, we are not supporting, you know, we appreciate that the um, the maker community has been extremely patient with us over the last couple of years, and I think the least we can do is to not support volume industrial sales uh, until uh, until we're in a, until we're in a solid stock position. And, and talk to me about that. So, is is this going to eat into any of the capacity of producing Raspberry Pi fours or zero twos? Um, not not really, no. no. So I think what you've got to remember is there's a huge amount of a huge amount of capacity at Sony, and right. we're not just talking about the site in Wales. Yeah. If you need to go to larger capacity, you, they can draw on other sites as well. They don't, yeah. they don't often, but yeah, they can draw for surge capacity, they yeah. can draw on other sites. Um, yeah. So there's no real limit there. Um, an interesting aspect of the board design is um, the replacement of um, through-hole um, uh, selective soldered components with intrusive reflow. 
uh, mm. components. So uh, something like the 40, well, all the connectors, the 40 pin connector, for example, where historically you would put it in, the, it'd be, it would be, you'd, do, you'd reflow both sides of the board. Yeah. Then you would go on a conveyor, uh, a robot, one of those kind of humaniform, if you've seen the, the yes, fashion the, videos, the kind of humaniform robots yeah. uh, would, would insert um, the 40 pin connector um, uh, and then there would then be selective solder and then the stage of examining that, a human stage to examine that to look for yeah. look for solder bridges. What we have now is those components are inserted during uh, reflow, before reflow. Yeah. Uh, they are they are uh, the connectors have been redesigned with high temperature plastic so they can re they can withstand reflow yeah. um, and also to create space um, so the you know, sort of hollowed out space so that you can put a thick paste you can put a nice dollop of paste on the top side pans yeah. um, and then when they reflow that flows into the uh, it's wicked down around yeah. the connector leg into the hole and makes an incredibly high quality joint yeah um, so yeah that, that's a what that means is that you're not competing for, there's actually a huge amount of, well, what does Sony have a huge amount of? They have a huge amount of pick and place capacity. Mm -hmm. um, they have a more limited amount of insertion and selective solder capacity. Yeah. Uh, and so what you're not doing is the, that capacity can still be used for Pi 4. Yeah. Um, and then we'll, we're using effectively a separate pool of capacity for Pi 5. Yeah, I think when we think about um, the creation of something like the Raspberry Pi 5, we, we tend to think about there's some guys, um, some boffins in a, in a room designing stuff that on computers, boffins. and then it just gets made in the factory. Yes. But I guess you also have to factor in how to productionize this, and I guess yeah, there's a lot Productionization of... boffins. Yeah. You know, we're very boffin-centric. <laughs> yeah. uh, boff I think boffin is a word which has fallen from favor, but I think it describes, <laughs> it, it describes certainly a, a certain British kind of, kind of uh, notion of, of what, um, of what uh, engineering looks like. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you're right, there, there's a, there are, I mean, clearly there are unique challenges accompanying each stage of the journey from building 100 or something to building 10 million or something. Yeah. We're on the 10 million end now, 10 million units a year. And, um, and those things show up both in the production, actually on the production line, but they also show up earlier in the design process as you try to design products that can be efficiently produced. Yeah. Um, and a lot of the, you know, I mean, James in particular has learned a lot of lessons over a decade. Yeah. Um, f by interacting with Sony, He's learned a lot of lessons about what it takes yeah. to be manufacturable. So we focus very much there on, on the hardware side of things. So is there anything specific on the software that um, kind of um, bookworm is it? Yeah, called? bookworm. So uh, we are due overdue a Debian upgrade. Um, uh, Debian bookworm um, uh, went uh, into freeze in roughly May or June this year. Uh, yeah, we normally release a Raspberry Pi OS, you know, one to two quarters after the Debian freeze. Yeah. Uh, that's bookworm. Uh, it's available for all Raspberry Pi devices. Um, uh, it will announce basically at the same time, maybe a couple of days after um, uh, Pi 5. Yeah. Um, uh, but it's, uh, and it is the supported OS for Raspberry Pi 5, so don't expect to see um, earlier operating yeah. systems, early operating system releases supported on this platform. Yeah. Uh, we put all our effort into there. In terms of what's, it, what, what's in there, a lot of infrastructure improvements, things like use of Pipewire, uh, yeah, we, we have Pipewire and Net Network Manager now, uh, where previously we had um, Pulse Audio. Yeah. Pulse Audio and DHCP CD. Yeah. DHCP CD. <laughs> DHCP D. DHCP D. Um, uh, so you so, you know we have some we have some 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 upgrades yeah. uh, to the uh, to the, uh, to the to the platform there. Probably the biggest um, user visible changes are include inclusion of Firefox as a uh, as a browser uh, as another browser uh, yeah. alternative and some work has gone in on on older platforms some work has gone in to support the video decoders the hardware yeah. video decoders interesting thing about raspberry pi 5 it has no h264 H decoding hardware in it it's all that uh, if you want to decode h264 you've got to do it in software yeah. um so it only has the only hardware acceleration it has is um h265 hevc yeah. uh, decoder 4k p60 yeah. Um, so, but on older platforms, obviously the video codec is a very important um, uh, component of, of the acceleration uh, of getting good performance in, yeah. in a web browser. Uh, so we've done some work here um, to, um, uh, to to enable that in Firefox. Yeah. Um, this is quite standards based, which is nice. Yeah. Uh, so, so you've got those, but I guess the big headline item is Wayland. Yes. Um, New UI. Uh, yeah. So on part on Raspberry Pi four and Raspberry Pi five, uh, we no longer use X. So we were using X plus Mutter yeah. as our composited uh, desktop stack. Uh, we're now using um, uh, Wi-Fi, an implementation of the Wayland protocol, mm. um, uh, and. Um, 
that works very nicely, actually. Yeah. I mean, you know, you know, Wayland's pitch is that it's a very efficient, buttery way of getting pixels onto the screen, and we do see a, yeah. uh, on Raspberry Pi 4, night and day. Yeah. X11, X11 with Mutter versus Wayland, very, very different uh, yeah. performance feel to yeah. the platform. So you're kind of stacking a, you're stacking together a two to three X hardware um, uh, improvement on not far off a 2x software improvement so that yeah. kind of the feel the immediacy of that platform is very uh, looks great it's, it's great yeah. um, we're not shipping Wayland on earlier products yet so we're not going to ship Wayland on um, Pi 1, 2 and 3 yeah. uh, Pi 0 and Pi 0 2 um, and, and the various derived compute modules, that's still going to be um, uh, X11, and it's non-composited X11. So it's technically a little bit of a step backwards there, yeah. uh, but we're, ta we're taking that step backwards in the expectation that we will ship um, uh, Wayland on those platforms with a Pixman backend, not with a GL backend, yeah. um, uh, in, in, within about a quarter. Yeah, it's going to be fascinating to see what people build with the, the Raspberry Pi 5 and what kind of extra things. That that enables. I mean, I'm excited by the cameras. Mm. You can, fact, you can have two of them very easily on there yeah. now. The and the machine, and, yeah, I mean, machine learning throughput. Yeah, I mean, the CPU machine learning throughput is going to be quite astounding, yeah. I think, for people. Now, if you think when we when the Pi 4 launched, you know, we didn't have things like ChatGPT and these large language models yeah. readily available. The whole AI thing exploded mm. um, reasonably recently to yeah. this year. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, be excited mm. to see. I'm I'm excited to get my hands on um, you know, g getting the most out of the Pi Five with uh, machine learning using some Python and. Yeah. and I, it, it's interesting. It validates that decision. We we, we always go for where we say we well, look. We're going to invest in software. Yeah. Uh, you know, for machine learning, we're going to invest in having really good CPUs. Because of course, if we'd invested in 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 machine learning two years ago, we would have ended up with an image centric machine learning acceleration architecture, yeah. um, which wouldn't have been any use for running LLMs. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, the nice thing about CPUs, it allows you to defer the, uh, the decision about the fine detail of what sort of models you're running. Yeah. And I love that Raspberry Pi has kept general purpose computing out there yeah. and, and front and center. N yes. None of this sort of specialized, or you, you know, uh, if you think about a regular Apple Mac, you can't do anything with that, you know, expansion wise other than plug extra things mm. in it. And, you know, yeah. with the GPO head is there, you can yeah. infinitely expand that. Yeah, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a lot of fun. I'd say it's still, you know, it's still a very, uh, yeah, I, I get myself beaten up by this boat for saying very unique, but it is, it is a unique, it's a unique platform. It's, yeah. you know, that, that focus on, focus on a steady improvement in CPU performance on the most general purpose possible yeah. type of performance alongside the interfacing capabilities is is the thing it sets it apart as a yeah. platform. We're probably going to see uh, about six months of comparison videos now, I think, as people get the Pi 5 alongside every other single board computer and <laughs> do a, yeah. a comparison. I don't think it's going to be alongside many of the other ones. <laughs> Out in front of out other, in front. Uh, out in front. Uh, it is. I mean, it, it is a you know for certainly for real world applications. Uh, two point four gig. Yeah. Two point four gig. Yeah. Um, uh, Cortex A seventy six is a lot of performance. I, I guess the, the the thing I always want to know from you guys is how do you know when to stop adding stuff to it because you can end up with a very expensive board and how uh, do you know when to stop adding features? <laughs> how do we know when to stop adding features? I think we are. I think we always have a concept in mind for a platform um, and on the hardware side we always have a concept in, in mind for a platform and and we kind of build the thing that's in the concept and I, I think we don't do, generally do feature creep very much on hardware just because yes. it's hard to do feature creep on hardware um, I think there are some things around the edge um, interestingly I experienced the inclusion of USB 3 on Raspberry Pi 4 as feature creep that my expectation had been that we would we would put a hub uh, and continue to use USB two yeah. that we'd gain gigabit Ethernet because we have the GMAC on the uh, on yeah. twenty seven eleven, uh, but that we would continue to use USB two for storage. Um, mm. And James pushed for the Violabs eight hundred five um, uh, part um, as we had a PCI Express lane. Um, you can see various sort of bones of products that didn't exist kind of sticking through there. In particular. Um, the uh, or, and also indications of us looking ahead. I mean, the uh, the USB world is interesting. Um, Twenty seven eleven has a PCI Express lane in order to talk to RP one. Yeah, RP one has taken so long that we when we were you know, our, our original optimistic est estimates of its schedule suggested it would align with Twenty seven eleven. So Twenty seven eleven early in its development was intended to be a 
just a, a pure digital host. Like, so 2712 is kind of a, well, what I call, as I say, it's a fast digits chip. It has yep. the processor, the GPU, um, some multimedia blocks. It has the PCI Express, the HDMI, which is too high bandwidth to move over yep. PCIe, uh, and, the DRAM, and the DRAM 5, DRAM control and 5. That's all it's got on it. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a very pure digital device. Um, 2711 is a monolithic chip. It's the old style monolithic chip. Mm -hmm. uh, but actually, its monolithicness was a uh, was a hedge almost. Um, the expectation had been that we'd ship it with with RP1 and we'd use the um, uh, the at least GPIO perhaps might be on RP1. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, and, um, and thus the PCI Express was specced onto uh, 2711. Now RP1 then doesn't turn up in time. Once you've got an X1 PCI Express channel, you can try and connect the via labs part, and that gave yeah. us the USB3. Um, of course, that via lab part via labs part has an XHCI controller and a hub, and four downstream USB 3s. Yep. Um, and yet we expose that on Pi 4 as two downstream USB 3s and uh, two downstream USB 2s. Yep. And the reason we do that is because we knew that RP1 would have two downstream USB 3s and two downstream USB 2s. So we artificially took a hit yeah. on the USB 3 um, uh, um, budget of Pi 4 in order to ensure that we didn't have a regression when we went to Pi 5. So it gives you an idea of how long, and that's the product yeah. that was designed in 2018. Um, yeah. So even by 2018, we'd already made the decision to, for area, for cost reasons, to go to USB 3, to USB 2 on RP1. Yeah. That's five years ago, we'd already made that decision. Wow. Yes, no, it's not true. <laughs> and my, my second favorite platform that you make is obviously the, the Pico. Mm. So, um, yeah, um, how's that going on the, the, the Pico space, Pico W? It's, it's, it's fantastic, right? Um, and that's some, that is some dumb luck, right, that we rocked up in early 2021 <laughs> with the microcontroller. Um, so Pico's always, uh, Pico and RP2040. Pico, it's always been as much or more about RP2040 as it has about Pico. You know, Pico's an important product for us because it gives people a, a low-cost way to experiment with yeah. um, RP2040. Pico W is important to us because it gives people a low-cost way to experiment with it, and it sort of leverages our general capabilities in Wi-Fi, our relationship with Infineon to get yeah. the modem, uh, and our experience with compliance, uh, compliance engineering. Um, so that's kind of... Um, you know, the, the, but they're, so they're important products, but they're kind of both important products because they enable people to get experience with RP2040. Yeah. Um, what's been really gratifying about that chip is the extent to which a number of companies, particularly Pimerini and Adafruit, yeah. um, uh, but quite a few other ARs as well, including Citron yeah. um, uh, and, and various other non-AR companies like Arduino, um, have have lent into developing boards on yeah. that, both because they like the chip and, of course, because the chip's been available. Yeah. Um, and so I'm kind of really proud to be able to make make a contribution to sustaining these are businesses that we love, businesses we care about, friends, human being friends yeah. as well as business friends. Yeah. Um, uh, and and they are these are companies. You know, the, the the shortage put a lot of great companies under a great deal of stress. Yeah. Um, and I think that a lot of the semiconductor majors were very badly behaved <laughs> in terms of how they, you know, so someone like, a, you know, a, you know I th honestly, I think you know, Microchip and NXP behaved terribly yeah. um, uh, to some of the companies we really care about. Yeah. Um, and so having a, a, a micro, even though those companies are really, they are, they, are, they create, business for yeah. those companies. Somehow they didn't feel that when the chips were down, so to speak, um, they, they didn't feel they had an obligation to stand by, stand yeah. by these people who had been being very good to them over the years. Yeah. So it's been great that we've been able, for, so in terms of our service to the community, it's been great for us that we were able to supply RP2040 through that drought to people yeah. and keep people's businesses going. And obviously from our point of view, it's been great that it's meant that a much broader range of people have had exposure to RP2040 than yeah. probably would have done in a normal year. Yeah, I mean, I'm not biased when I think about things from Pimeroni, for example, but I think they were able to range. pivot, you know, when, yeah. when the RP2040 came out and all those it's new products company. that are available, they so continue important. to knock out, yeah. Yeah, incredible. Yeah, 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 both. Yeah, both. Yeah, they and Adafruit kind of did amazing things. Um, you know, uh, we, we are, we'll sell. I guess we'll sell this year between one and two million Picos, but wow. we'll sell the best part of five million RP twenty forties. Yeah, um, and that's that's that is um, that feels like impact. In fact, last yeah. year 
when we you know, we had a tough year last year on the core product, we only yeah. we only sold people. People <laughs> was great last year. Was I you know it was it's. It was interesting to hear some people saying online, wow, Raspberry Pi aren't making boards anymore. I'm like, we made five million Raspberry Pis last year. Yeah. We didn't make as many as we wanted. Seven, we'd made seven million the year before and seven million the year before that. So yeah. we didn't make as many as we wanted, but it wasn't that we weren't making Raspberry Pis, it was just demand outstripping supply. Yeah. Um, what was interesting is in the context of that reduced supply, we actually shipped more compute experiences on RP2040 than we shipped yeah. compute experiences on the classic platform. And of course they're low cost, you know, these are, these are you yeah. know, uh, $4 Pico, $6 Pico Ws, 50 cent, whatever, um, uh, RP, RP2040s, but they're still compute experiences, they're still, they're still things with Raspberry Pi logos on them, yeah. uh, and, and that, that was really gratifying. Yeah, and people, people ask me online why, why do I pick Raspberry Pi over other platforms? whether it's in the, uh, the microcontroller space or in the, the single board computer space. And I think it's more than just the, the hardware, it's more than just the software, mm. it's the whole environment, isn't it? It's the yeah. ecosystem of suppliers making things for it. You yeah. know, the, the pretty much now industry standard 40 pin header, which yes. you guys kind of invented. It's amazing, isn't it? You, it's yeah. so easy to create a standard. <laughs> yeah. you, you look back and you think, wow, if I knew I was creating a standard, I mean, might, have, might have worked a little bit harder on it. <laughs> um, but the, um, yeah, it's, it's interesting, isn't it, that it's a very the the kind of the the, the Raspberry Pi advantage yeah. is very broad based. You know, they are oh, quality hardware products. We spend a huge amount of money on software, yeah. um, and that's true both of the of the in the big space and the microcontroller space. Yeah. Um, uh, and then you you just have this amazing community of companies and of people. Yeah. Uh, and if you have a problem with the Raspberry Pi, probably somebody else has had that problem before, and they've written about it and it's on Stack Exchange somewhere. Yeah. So the Googleability. It's the Google. I also think there's a little bit about Linux and Google. That kind of how could they grew up together? Yeah. Like it would have been hard to build Google without Linux computers to run the search engine on. Yeah. And it's actually hard. The thing that's made Linux tractable as a platform for the end user is the fact that usually if you've got a problem, you can Google it. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and and certainly I find now if I'm using Linux on an x86 on a legacy PC, um, which legacy PC, which is what we call things that uh, you get from Intel. Um, if you're using it on a legacy PC, when you Google a question, what you tend to get is a Raspberry Pi answer. Yeah. Because in, in Linux client, not Linux server, but in Linux client, uh, a non-Android Linux client, uh, Raspberry Pi is, is really shockingly dominant. Now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and uh, th there's probably a number of reasons why, why that is, you know, the open source nature of Linux mm. um, uh, and yeah, just the, the the breadth of people out there who use it. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah there's there's yeah. many aspects to that. It's, it's all about fifty five million Raspberry Pis, so they are everywhere. Everywhere, and everywhere. I, I was yeah. shocked to find just how many b before the sort of industrialization you know, industry using them. There was a lot in industry kind of um, black IT. There was a lot of companies using yeah. them for various different. Um, yeah. Um, there's oh, a black, I like black IT. Black IT. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's the thing, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, there's yeah. many companies who use them. Um, so, for example, say you have a production line and you've got something flying down a conveyor belt and um, all of a sudden you're getting, like, once in a blue moon, something happens and it creates a great big crash and you've got product going everywhere. And you want to know why that is. Mm. You know, you can put a Raspberry Pi on there. You can do measurements. You can put sensors on there. You can put mm. cameras on there. It's a very quick easy thing to do, mm. low cost, without having to, you know, refactor things. And sense, yeah, sensor overlays are really interesting, right? Because, you know, if you see where Raspberry Pi has been successful in industrial context, often uh, it is sensing rather than actuation. Because, you know, retooling the actuation, the, yeah. the, 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 the output side um, of industrial control is hard. Yeah. Um, Raspberry Pi is great at that, but it's a huge investment. Yeah. Where adding sensor overlays is easy. You know, yeah. the, because it's incremental. Your value is incremental, and your return on investment calculation is an incremental return on investment calculation. So you can say, you know, if we are providing you with a very low cost way to add a sensor overlay into your system, you can just add up the cost of putting that, which is hopefully not much, yeah. and then you can add up the benefit you can get from it, which is hopefully more. Yeah. Um, and that's why you see, and, and then, and as you say, it's then very amenable to this. I'm going to 
to use that. I'm going to use that phrase. It's very amenable to this kind of black IT world where people who are relatively lower down an organization yeah. but have some devolved budgetary, uh, have some devolved responsibility to save money and budgetary ability to spend money in order to save money. Yeah. And, and organizations have a lot of people like that yeah. um, are able to go and select Raspberry Pi as a platform for doing it without having to go through kind of formal formal procurement processes. Yeah. Um, you know, if you have the ability, you know, this idea of Raspberry Pi's as almost being consumable. Yeah, you're getting a lot of good use cases now, um, and I know that you're sort of leaning into that with like Brom. Um, Brompton, were Brompton great. Brompton's yeah. a great example because we love their products. Yeah. It's always lovely when you have a company where you love their product, and yeah. then you discover that oh, it's actually made with Raspberry Pi's. And we had that with uh, I had that a long time ago with T-shirts. I think um, uh, you know, sort of finding oh, I love these T-shirts. Oh, wow, that factory is full of Raspberry Pi's. <laughs> um, you know, it's, and, and of course, you know. Um, uh, particularly satisfying, Liz has been looking at a lot of space applications recently, and, and so 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 nice when you, you know, go to a space conference and, and you see the number of people who are flying. Yeah. Um, hardware of all sorts, Raspberry Pi of all sorts, from zero to to uh, Pi four to to um, yeah. uh, to, to RP twenty forty. Yeah. Um, so it's it's always nice when, and as I say, you know, if you sell fifty five million or something, um, th they are. Basically everywhere. Yeah, yeah. Know, we know that we know they're at Disney a lot. You know, we, we're big we're big Disney fans. We love to go to Disneyland, Disney World. We know how much we have an informal indication uh, of how much Raspberry yeah. Pi there is in the parks, and it's a lot of Raspberry Pi. Yeah, I wonder how long it'd be before there's a Pi Five in space because uh, I know you've, every yeah. other one has been. <laughs> yeah, they've all been they've all been up there. I mean, probably fairly quick. Um, mm. I, I do think it's uh, there, are, there are interesting challenges, of course, that as you go down process node, um, the 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 uh, the like nominally. I, mean, I don't think we have really any experimental evidence to back this up. Say between um, the classic Pi three and earlier mm. and modern Pi Pi four, um, I don't think we have um, any concrete evidence um, that the likelihood of single event upsets is higher on 28 than it is on 40. But you've got to think as you push down to 16 nanometers where yeah. we are now and, and, and as we push on into the future, you've got to think you get to a point where the kind of the fragility of the mm. SRAM, you know, the amount of energy in an SRAM bit goes down. Yeah. And then if the amount of energy goes down, the likelihood of some cosmic ray coming in and, and flipping that bit goes up. Yeah. Um, so it'll be interesting. It'll be interesting to see where that yeah. where, where that trade off uh, where that trade off comes comes to yeah. rest. Fantastic. Well, Love it. that's everything I've got for you today. Cool. Uh, thank you so much for, for having me, and uh, yeah, it's been great speaking with you. Oh no, so, thank you, thank you, thank you very much. I'm looking forward to seeing how the next couple of weeks that's goes. It. I'll be in the virtual queue on the launch Excellent. on the availability day, uh, buying one. Good. Great stuff. Thank you very thank much. You. Bye for now. Yes. Thank you. I was wondering about doing the bit where I'd say, so Jason, tell me about your latest film. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's, yeah, it was, you mentioned the parks. It's, it's, it's funny, we, we, were in the, we were in the parks and, and I, I don't know what it was about how I was appearing, but I was basically getting stopped every five minutes. Uh, and this was, and this was, and this is like, um, these are the people who stop you. I mean, and you see the double takes as you walk along. And, and I mean, I don't, it, it's, it's not actually that striking. Yeah. Um, it's particularly striking from behind, <laughs> which is like, you know. Um, and um, the, uh, uh, but I did have one where I went into the Starbucks that's at um, Hollywood Studios. I was in the queue at Starbucks. I got to the front and the barista served me. And then she says, uh, did everyone ever tell you, anyone ever tell you you, uh, you look like? And I'm like, ah, yes. And then she goes, Bruce Willis. <laughs> I'm like, oh my god, I'm getting old. <laughs> what is it they say about the? I didn't. Do you do you know honest trailers? The, the oh yeah, yeah, yeah. They did not honest trailers for Die Hard. <laughs> the, the 1980s when every action hero looks like an unstoppable roid monster. No one kicks more ass than the guy from Moonlighting who looks like your dad. <laughs> so I'm like, yeah, I'm the guy from Moonlighting who looks Moonlighting. like your dad now. And then she did so. And well, kind of like if he, if Bruce Willis and Jason Statham had a love child. <laughs> um, and I'm like, oh, okay. Well, that's that's a horrible thought. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> horrible, terrible thought. And if you enjoyed this video, please give it a like and make sure you subscribe to the channel as well. It really means a lot to me when people do subscribe, so please subscribe to the channel. And I do go live every single Sunday at seven o'clock UK local time, so hopefully I can catch you on one of the live shows and say hi in person. I hope you enjoyed this video and I shall see you all next time. Bye for now.